Hi guys, Chauncey here, back again, and I'd like to talk to you today a little bit more about my philosophy and kind of my newest project that I'm going to be working on and I'll be documenting on this channel here. My next project is going to be a wide area tracking system. So I want to talk first of all about the future of augmented reality or uh, probably it's better said that uh, it's more of the future of wearable computing. Um, if you kind of set up a news feed on Google, Google News for wearable computing, there's definitely several articles per day being published. And, uh, you know, let's be honest, if you speak of augmented reality, you're really just talking about the, the display technology or the display configuration to start with. Um, so <clears throat> when I say wearable computing, you know, fundamentally, this is the same thing that you have on your desk, right? You know, that's not wearable, right? You have a computing unit, a display unit, you know, your monitor, and then some sort of human computer interaction unit, which would be a mouse or a keyboard, right? So these are basically the three fundamental pieces of hardware that you actually need to do uh, computing, personal computing. So if we're talking wearables, uh, say for instance, like an augmented wearable, you know, a lot of people nowadays that are tech people uh, are forward thinking about the Google Glass project. So <clears throat> we're talking, you know, some sort of head mounted display that allows us to see the real world and also some sort of virtual computer based overlay. Okay, so that can represent a display device, right? Possibly a compute device. I mean, they haven't released the specs of exactly what's going on there. Um, anyway, so what I'm wanting to talk about talk about here is kind of those three components. So, computing hardware is pretty well on its track, and there's lots of money involved, and there's lots of commercial value already when it comes to wearable computing. Uh, I consider you know putting your cell phone in your pocket. A wearable computing device because you can wear it on your person and it's not invasive it's not a big deal everyone does it so I would say it's not so much something to worry about in innovating in an area of computing now display technology is another story um, but it's a little it's it's close I would say in the in the race of wearable computing I'd say it's it's a close second uh, display technology has you know come from the giant uh, head mounts such as giant 80s head mount head mounted displays to actually like small uh, personal displays that you can watch 3d movies on uh, and they have reasonable prices and you know some of them are see-through now we see Vuzix, uh the company that I personally really like uh, they have the the star 1200 that's the display that I have the see-through the augmented reality display that I have <laughs> has a really small field of view, but it's really good to prototype this stuff out before, you know, the display hardware catches up. And uh, they're working on Smart Track, which is a, or I mean, I'm sorry, Smart uh, Smart Glasses, which are a different kind of configuration of the electronics and the the display style. So we'll see those come out in the next, you know, few years or maybe even sooner. Uh, so mobile devices take care of computing. Like I said, display technology is catching up. I mean, we haven't even seen Google Glass as a product yet. It should be available for developers here, I think, this Christmas or after this Christmas. But <coughs> the next thing is tracking or human-computer interaction. So the mouse, you know, works really well on a desktop. Keyboard works really well on a desktop. And we've integrated that pretty well into the touch screens on the, the mobile phones we have now. So we have a, our virtual world is shown within the smartphone itself, and the touch screen is the human computer interaction, right? So if we wear a head mount, how are we going to interact with the world that's being projected over the top of the real world, right? You can think of augmented reality as a second world. You can even think of virtual reality as a second world. Although in virtual reality, you don't see the real world as well. That's the difference. So with the concept of <coughs> motion tracking coming in as the form of 
human computer interaction, you know, artists and, and interface designers will, will use that and uh, you know, make, a, make some sort of a solution. Apparently Google has a patent on a, a human computer interaction device for their Google Glasses that is in the form of some sort of uh, finger sensor. So it actually uh, senses when you move your finger and you can, you can navigate the interface that's being displayed apparently. So that's all good. So in traditional virtual reality, uh, we, have, we have tracking systems. You know, we have, like nowadays in cinema and VR, we have the Viacon system, which is, I think it's Viacon. I don't, we don't have one here at IU, but they're like the highest end. They are like super, super high refresh rates. I mean, we're talking 300 hertz or more. And uh, they basically can measure position and orientation well, position within sub-millimeter and orientation within, you know, some high degree of precision of degrees. And uh, the, the systems are pretty easy to set up and use and everything. Uh, here at IU, we have uh, ART Track, which is just a competitor to Vicon, but they're a little bit more inexpensive. Their sub-millimeter position tracking as well and their high refresh rate, not quite 300 hertz, but, you know, about 150. Then we also have magnetic systems from Paul Hemis and... Uh, Ascension, which is kind of the older system, the flock of birds, where basically, okay, so tracking your your position and orientation, all you're trying to produce is in a reasonable amount of refreshes per second, which, you know, 60 or more is pretty sufficient, but if you want really high-speed graphics, um, you don't want people to be able to observe your latency, you do want, you know, over 120 at least to, uh, to look to look pretty good as far as the latency of the tracking. Um, <coughs> so let's break down these tracking systems. We have camera-based tracking where it's basically just a camera constantly taking pictures and the computer is running an algorithm on each one of those pictures to generate X, Y, Z as well as roll, pitch, and yaw. And it's doing this via a computer vision algorithm that you know sometimes is looking for a flat 2D marker, kind of like a fiducial. I've got one over here, and uh, you know this is what a lot of people are used to nowadays. It's a really inexpensive to produce and use. Uh, but then there's also other things you can use. Let me go grab a reflector. You see these are uh, these are reflective balls that are, are uh, reflective in IR light. And basically they plume out and they create just this really bright spot and these are in a known geometry so the algorithm that's in the tracker can discern the position and orientation of these and <coughs> you're really talking about real-time electronics with uh, real-time firmware of course and then the concept of you know, getting as many measurements per second as possible delivered to the graphics pipeline, whatever that may be. It could be a two-dimensional graphics pipeline. Most likely it's going to be some sort of 3D, like DirectX or OpenGL pipeline. Nowadays, since augmented reality is so, like, <coughs> it's so, like, at the cusp of, you know, like, the financial realm, like, the private sector, and then still the research sector, which has pretty much owned it for the last 30 years, uh, it's at the cusp right there of not knowing where it's going to go yet as far as uh, how things are going to function. Anyway, so you have those camera-based systems, and then there are um, like what I would call substrate-based systems. So you create some sort of substrate in the air, a wireless substrate. Um, it could be radio frequency, it could be light, it could be sound, and you use that to localize where you are. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a second. The third type of tracking that uh, is really common right now is kind of is electromechanical sensor-based tracking or just electrical component-based tracking. So usually you're going to get relative data from this. It's uh, like InvenSense, they're a company that makes the uh, hybrid sensor for the uh, mobile devices for like iPhones and stuff that can actually measure your orientation relatively easily and uh, your position, eh, kind of clunky. And uh, these sensors work really well for like maybe an app that's going to run for, or maybe a use of it 
that's only going to run for like a few minutes to maybe up to 10 minutes. And then you start to have problems with drift and then <laughs> people managing the data properly in the, in the code that they're writing. Uh, so those are pretty much the three. You have camera based, and I'm just talking about human computer interaction here. You have uh, camera based tracking, you have uh, substrate based tracking, and then you have uh, sensor based tracking. Sorry. Uh, the, then the cool thing about that is then, you know, we could hybridize them. We can put one with the other, you know, put them all together and basically manage for all things. But basically, what is the whole end goal here, all right? So I like, uh, there's a video online uh, on Kickstarter for the Oculus head-mounted display. And their goal with this head-mounted display is really large field of vision and basically it's being pushed by the gaming industry and the interest of gamers that they want to, you know, they want to play video games physically. They want to run around and play video games. Well, that's kind of the idea based on, or in my mind, of you know, what the ultimate uh, scenario would be for developing an application. And uh, in order to do that, you're going to need, you know, like I said, computing hardware, tracking hardware, and display hardware. The Oculus happens to be a special display hardware. So I'm personally looking at the kind of the future philosophy of where these things are going based on you know, what's available, how many different companies are competing for these things, and you know, what kind of miracle hardware or software are we going to need to make this stuff all work out in, say, five years. You know, I think that's a reasonable amount of time to ask for this style of uh, you know, augmented reality. And uh, <coughs> tracking, that's the problem. So these systems I was, I was just outlining, they don't work within a very large area. We have small indoor areas that they work within, or if you take it outdoors and work with it, it's, it's not quite the best. So a good example of this being deployed right now and being used for outdoors or everywhere would be uh, what cell phone companies are calling LBS, or location-based services. Okay, so they're relying on localization from GPS uh, sensors that can get you within, say, six inches of where you are up to three meters, uh, depending on how good a signal you're getting, how much weather there is, and how good a sensor you have on your device. Now, a lot of you will already know, because you have GPS sensors, that these systems, they have, they're really slow. They can update your position, you know, oh, I don't know exactly amount, how to, amount of speed, but it's definitely not 120 hertz uh, or more. They are within a few inches, which in v virtual reality or augmented reality, that's too much. That's not, that's not accurate enough. And uh, the other thing is this is the nature of how a GPS works. So there are signals, radio signals, coming down from these satellites that have a certain wavelength. And uh, you have to basically respond to that and localize where you are. And uh, you know, I don't know a ton about GPS, but all the testing I've done with them for wide area localization is just not accurate enough, bottom line. Um, maybe the military has something that I don't have access to, I'm sure they do, that uh, can do tracking that's really high frequency and really accurate, and that's great. But obviously civilians don't have access to this, so what, what do I have to work with here? So I'm, my next project is going to be a wide area tracking system. Now. One of the best substrates, I think, for wide area tracking is radio frequency. And I, in fact, you can see on my wall here, my whiteboard, I have an attenuation mathematical model to simulate in softwares like MATLAB, you know, radio frequency, a different a radio transmission, you know, maybe at different frequencies, maybe dual broadcasts, um, maybe with modulation, without modulation. <coughs> I'm delving into uh, RF engineering which is kind of a splintered track off of electrical engineering. I'm not an electrical engineer or a radio frequency engineer, but uh, I've got enough just kind of maker, maker chops that I'm gonna try to figure this out. And I'm, I work at a university, so I can uh, talk to local, local electrical engineers and get some advice. Um, I'm definitely gonna take on this project slower than what an actual engineer would do because I'm learning as the whole process goes along. But honestly, my passion is the concept of bringing, my passion is bringing 
the CG world to the real world. Seamlessly. As much as to the point where we could touch it, but that's a whole other story for a whole other day, maybe a few years down the road. Um, anyway, so I'm going to be taking a lot of steps in this and probably making some failures, but I'm going to put it all up here on YouTube for you guys to see. Um, I'd love to hear from anyone out there who's a, an RF engineer or someone in localization uh, that maybe give me, give me some tips. Hybrid models, I think, is probably what I'm going to go with. What I mean by that is not just using radio frequency, but using radio frequency and GPS and something else and something else and something else to kind of build a manager within a, a sensor device that can do tracking, that kind of switches between the, all these different readings and... I don't know. I mean, it's a really fun project, though. It's like a concept of what could do this, and then let's build it. There really isn't a lot of different companies doing doing localization and tracking. I mean, companies like Verizon and AT&T and and T-Mobile they're pushing location-based services because they see mon they see a lot of money that can be made. So they're really pushing this concept as well. But <laughs> nothing is available, obviously, uh, publicly. Now there are a lot of papers, so that's one that's one area I am starting, and I'm reading countless papers. I mean, I didn't realize there was this much being published about localization, but the other hand is, I've been using this word localization. Localization represents half of what I have to do. So, you know, VR, AR, you have to have six individual pieces of data. I need X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, and yaw, and that's for one sensor, like maybe your head. Or your, or your your wrist, you know. I've got to do this for several devices, and we live in the wireless age, so it's got to be done wirelessly. Um, this is a challenge, but I'm excited to to get in, get on board working on this stuff. Uh, anyway, this is a long video, I know, guys, but that's my philosophy. That's kind of where my head's at right now. And uh, please, please ask questions, give me suggestions. Um, like I said, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm not a radio frequency engineer, but I think I'm going to try to become an amateur one here shortly. So, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.